Good evening. My name is Barbara Sain. I'm a member of the Department of Theology here at the University of St. Thomas, and I'm going to get us started tonight. We have a rather impressive sounding <laughs> choral accompaniment. <laughs> um, we're going to close the doors, and hopefully that will make it quiet. Oh, it just got very quiet. Okay. Um, so they sounded good, but it'll be good to be able to hear what we're doing in here as well. I'm going to start with one practical thing, um, which is to call your attention to the feedback form. Those of you who registered for the full conference will have this in your packets. It's those of you who are just stopping by for the talk tonight that I want to, um, to let you know about this. Part of what it asks for is how you found out about the conference and if you would like to be notified about future events like this. So there's a pile of these out on the registration desk. And if you're just here for the talk tonight, but you would like to know about future things, grab one of these and fill it out, and you'll be sure to be in the loop <laughs> for anything fun we do in the future. So like I said, I'm a member of the theology department here. And I've had the good fortune to work with two colleagues from the School of Engineering. Camille George and John Wentz, team teaching a course that we have here at St. Thomas that's called Christian Faith and the Engineering Profession. Now, in just out in the big wide world in social situations when I'm meeting people and they ask me what I do, I tell them I teach at St. Thomas. It's pretty common for them to then say, well, what kind of courses do you teach? So I describe the standard theology courses that I teach and they nod and they might comment, especially if they're interested in theology themselves, they might light up. And then I say that I teach a theology and engineering course, and almost invariably, I get this puzzled look. Sometimes it's a confused puzzled look, sometimes it's just a blank puzzled look. And it's followed by a question, something like, really, what could you possibly teach in a course like that? Or theology and engineering? How do they go together? <laughs> so I explain that the course gives students an opportunity to think about how their professional work intersects with their personal convictions and to form an integrated vision for themselves of what it means to be a good engineer. For some students, that means bringing a philosophical worldview or a set of ethical convictions and putting it together with their future professional goals. And for many students here at St. Thomas, it means bringing their religious beliefs and a sense of their engineering, their future engineering work as a vocation, not just a job that's gonna pay the bills, but something that is a calling for them. And then I also say to my conversation partner that the course helps students think about broader issues, how engineers function in the world, the influence that they have, and how social, political, and economic forces can shape the options that engineers have to do good work in the world. And at this point, whoever I'm talking to is usually saying, you know, oh, who knew? <laughs> you know, there's actually stuff like that that you could talk about in the course. Now, many of you in the room tonight would know what you might put in a course on theology and engineering, or philosophy and engineering, or engineering ethics. Because you know that engineers are everywhere. There's lots of them. And they shape the environment that we live and work in. If you came today by car, they probably, they were definitely involved in designing the car. If you came by light rail and bus, they were involved. If you came by plane, they were involved. If you biked, they were involved. Now if you walked, I'm not sure I can draw the connection, but I can tell you that the civil engineers were involved with the sidewalks or the streets that you walked on, as well as the, bridg the bridges and roads and airports and everything else that we used. And the ice just dribbled down, gravity is working. <laughs> the engineers were involved with the sound system that I'm using right now to communicate for you, to you, the lights, the electricity, the food preparation. If the food that you eat during this conference is cool or heated, the engineers were involved with that. If it was transported, they were involved with that. They do medical equipment. 
big scale like MRIs and small scale like stents that go in your veins and stuff like that. Many of you have a phone. This is actually a good time for me to suggest that you might silence it. <laughs> and the engineers designed the phone, they designed the software, they designed the satellites and the towers that your phones are communicating with. Think about the chair that you're sitting on. Now, I can't say for sure that an engineer was involved with the design of a chair, but these chairs were mass produced, and the engineers would have helped design the factory that mass produced them. Think about the clothes you're wearing. Unless you're wearing entirely natural fibers like cotton, silk, wool, that were only, um, that went through the process of going from fiber to fabric done entirely by hand, and not very many of you would be, at least not head to foot in your clothing, the engineers were involved with that because any kind of artificial fabric like rayon, tensile, performance athletic wear, any of that, polyester, acrylic, is shaped from the natural world through processes that engineers are involved in. Have I covered everything in the room? Oh, the air is coming through a ventilation system that the engineers were involved with. I didn't mention your shoes, because truthfully I know more about fabric than I do about rubber and stuff like that, but I'm sure they were involved with your shoes. They're everywhere. <laughs> Engineering and engineers are absolutely everywhere. And I did not yet mention computers, um, social media, and something else which is on my list. Oh, entertainment. Computers, entertainment, and social media, which are even bigger categories than the one, ones that I've mentioned. So, those of many of you coming into the room tonight would know that engineers, that there's a lot to talk about in a course on engineering, and those of you who didn't know that already <laughs> have a long, long list that I suggested to you. I think it would be reasonable when I say I teach theology and engineering, or when other people say they teach philosophy and engineering or engineering ethics, for the response to be a very puzzled look, but followed by the question, how could you possibly fit that all into one course? Don't you need a year, <laughs> two years? This conference recognizes how um, integrally engineering is built into our culture and how complex the issues are that engineers have to think through and that a lot of other people <coughs> need to be involved with the discussion. It's a conference that has people coming from a variety of the traditional disciplines of the liberal arts, as well as a wide variety of the engineering disciplines. So it's appropriate that our first welcome and introduction is going to be done by the deans of two schools here at St. Thomas. The dean of engineering, Dean Donald Weinkauf, who's standing over there, he's gonna be the first to speak followed by Dean Terrence Langen, who is the Dean of Arts and Sciences. So, Donald Weinkauf will be the first. Great, I'll keep my comments brief because we have an amazing speaker uh, that stands behind both Terry and I, and I don't want to keep you from him. Um, but uh, I just want to welcome you, actually, for those from outside the University of St. Thomas and for those who are from inside of University of St. Thomas, uh, welcome to what I think will be uh, a, a very invigorating discussion and conference about this combination of engineering and ethics and developing a culture of ethics. Um, so I, I can't uh, start this conference without just, by the way, just say thanking Barb, Dr. Barb Sane. Uh, she's really been driving this, this collection of people, uh, and so she's just walked out of the room, but in her absence, let's just say thank you to Barb Zinn. Um And now, I, I've been an engineering student. I have uh, uh, worked in industry. Uh, I have now been an engineering educator for probably the last 20 years, and I'm going to tell you right now that the Engineering ethics or engineering educators have a lot of work to do in this space. We are actually not very good at it. We're not, we're not trained, we're not immersed in it. And I think this combination that we see here at St. Thomas in terms of the, the, 
collaboration between theology and philosophy and ethics is, and, and engineering is, is just a fantastic story to tell. And, you know, there are a few engineers in the room, and I'm sure that your engineering ethics education experience is probably no different than, or not much different than mine. Uh, as an engineering student, one day, I walked into one class, and the professor who probably had an engineering ethics education, probably as deep as mine was before I walked into that class, handed out a sheet of paper with the engineering code of ethics. And from that one sheet of paper, uh, a lecture, or maybe, uh, at a, uh, maybe I wouldn't call it a thrilling lecture, but about a 15 minute discussion, maybe not even a discussion, a 15 minute one way conversation happened. And it kind of goes something like this. Don't do this, don't do that. Uh, uh, be honest when you're dealing with people. Uh, don't work in things that you don't know anything about. Um, uh, Safety is important. Uh, and uh, do you guys have any questions? Now, you think I'm exaggerating, but there's a few giggles in this room because that's exactly what most, the vast majority of engineers' ethics education contains. Fortunately, we've come a long way since that 1980s ethics, engineering ethics education, and institutions like the University of St. Thomas and Seattle and Dayton, uh, where engineering and liberal arts are combined, uh, have the opportunity to change that experience. They have the opportunity to engage our students in true discussion, to have our students struggle with the lens of John Stuart Mill, to have our students dissect the complexities of Aristotle's virtues. All of those things are possible inside of our education here at a St. Thomas or a Dayton or a Seattle or a Notre Dame, where these things that, uh, that we that we say are important truly are because we want to make sure our students uh, have that experience. And so we, in fact, are now transposing that understanding out into other engineering schools that it's not enough. It's not enough to have that 15 minute conversation about engineering ethics. And that's really important because we want our students to be able to apply what they are learning. Give them the tools to be able to rationalize what their decisions are. And I think as Aristotle I think said, so that they can experience the experience of actions in life. And that's really important to us. That it's not just getting a set of rules, that it's taking those perspectives, those lenses, and then being able to translate that into actually the actions of life. And that's what's important. And so that's why we're here, because the work that we've started to do at St. Thomas, at Seattle, at Dayton, and all the schools that we have represented here is just the start. As I said, it was only 20 years ago when engineering ethics education was exactly what I told you in my own experience. And there's a few, still a few nodding heads. And so this is a joint com conference with faculty and engineering educators, people from industry, who want to build a more common understanding of the difficult dilemma that we're preparing our students to engage in. Because you know what? The easy problems have been solved and it's the more complex ones that are gonna challenge our students even more so that this conference should help us uh, unravel and dissect. And so with that, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Terry Langer the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, who will introduce our speaker tonight. Oh, and one second, can I, Terry, can I just, I forgot so, one thing here. We do have a couple of other speakers that I wanna make sure that we mention. Tomorrow night, we'll have uh, uh, Greg uh, Stedronsky from General Mills, Vice President of Manufacturing. He'll be talking about culture ethics at General Mills. And then uh, Saturday morning, we'll have Dr. Mike Quinn, who'll be talking about tuning into ethics, and following that, we'll have a panel discussion. And with that, I'm going to introduce Terry Langan, who will introduce our speaker for tonight, Brad Kellenberg. Thank you. I'd like to add my own welcome uh, to that of Dean Weinkoff, 
to all the visitors to our campus. Uh, as Don said, my name is Terry Langan, and I'm very proud to be the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences here at St. Thomas. And I'm especially pleased that you're here with us tonight uh, on our beautiful campus. When Barbara Sane came to me a couple years ago with the idea for this conference, I thought it was a great idea. Actually, to tell you the truth, I probably had a puzzled look on my face. But after it explained to me only like two more times, because I'm a dean, I only take two more times, I really thought it was a good idea. I think that idea was captured well in the call for papers, which read, because the practice of engineering is tightly interwoven with economic, political, legal, and social issues in the public sphere, interdisciplinary conversations play an important role in engineering ethics on the professional level. This need for cross-disciplinary conversations is mirrored on the individual level as engineers try to integrate their technical work with their religious beliefs, cultural heritage, and social responsibilities. The University of St. Thomas would seem to be an ideal venue to begin these cross-disciplinary conversations. We have a very strong College of Arts and Sciences here. Barb Sain's Home Department of Theology is especially strong, with 28 accomplished full-time faculty leading the way. St. Thomas is also home to a very successful and growing School of Engineering, ably led by Dean Weinkoff. In my opinion, though, it owes some of its success to the Liberal Arts Foundation that each of its students receives as part of their education here at St. Thomas. This conference is unique and will be successful because, like our undergraduate program, it brings together the discussion of ethics and engineering with a liberal arts foundation and a discussion of the role of faith. With engineering and the liberal arts working together, we hope to provide a strong ethical foundation for, our, for, our, for engineers, both at the undergraduate and en undergraduate programs we offer, but also in this professional conference we are sponsoring. Leading us off in our efforts this evening is our featured speaker, Dr. Brad Kallenberg. Dr. Kallenberg is Professor of Theology and Ethics at the University of Dayton, where he focuses on topics arising at the interface of science, engineering, and theology. After taking a degree in e science education at the University of Minnesota, Dr. Kallenberg spent a decade in campus ministry throughout the upper Midwest. At the end of this time, and still with an eye to ministry, Dr. Kallenberg entered graduate school to study theology. He completed an MA in Biblical Studies and Theology, followed by a PhD in Philosophical Theology and Ethics at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pas Pasadena, California. Dr. Kallenberg taught for a number of years at a variety of schools, including St. Petersburg Academy in Russia, before moving to Ohio in the fall of 2001 to join the Religious Studies Department at the University of Dayton. He teaches a variety of ethics courses there, including a pioneering course in engineering ethics that compares ethics to engineering design. Dr. Kallenberg has authored and or edited six books, including God and Gadgets, Following Jesus in a Technological Age, published in 2010, and also By Design, Theology, Ethics, and the Practice of Engineering, published in 2013. He has also published a wide range of journal articles and book chapters. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brad Kallenberg. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to come speak. Uh, thank you to Dean uh, Langan and uh, Dean Weinkoff and Dr. Sane for your leadership in this conference. Thank you very much. So uh, Malcolm Gladwell recounts the story, uh, perhaps you've heard it, about an engineer, a priest and a doctor enjoying a round of golf. Ahead of them is a group playing so slowly and inexpertly that in frustration, the three ask the greenskeeper for an explanation. Well, that's a group of blind firefighters, they're told. They lost their sight saving our clubhouse last year, so we let them play for free. The priest says, I will say a prayer for them at Mass. The doctor says, 
well, let me ask my ophthalmologist colleagues if anything can be done for them. And the engineer asks, why can't they play at night? <laughs> now the joke alludes to the very real fact that engineers tend to see an entirely different world than the rest of the population. I take this fact to be a very good thing. In fact, the ability to see a world that others cannot see is, in the end, what separates bona fide engineers from mere technicians. Billy Von Cohen, a professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Texas at Austin, observed that today American engineers are increasingly in the danger of what he calls transom window engineering. Perhaps you recall the era of black and white films where business was conducted behind the closed door of the Acme Detective Agency. But above the door, you would see a transom window to allow some cross ventilation. In Cohen's mind, American engineering is coming ever closer to an al analogous situation. Engineers are locked together in a closed room. The rest of society is outside. Society chucks requests for gadgets say the iPhone 42 with a radical new feature, an earphone jack. Society chucks the request through the open transom window. Engineers build the gadget, throw it back outside. What's wrong with this picture? Well, there's no communication between engineers who see one world and the rest of the society that sees another. Leaving society with no way to discover what are the full array of possibilities and leaving engineers with no way to tell society what people think they want may not be what they really want. On the transom window model, engineers aren't really engineers at all, but have been reduced to technicians who just do what they're told. This isn't the first time in modern history that engineers have been tempted to keep their heads down. There are some examples as, as spectacular as they are uh, nefarious. From the Soviet era, uh, Alexei Gastev, who in 1920 became director of the Central Institute of Labor in Moscow, urged his comrades, let us take the storm of the revolution in Soviet Russia, united to the pulse of American life, and do our work like a chronometer. Fulfilling this vision was rendered next to impossible by the fact that Joseph Stalin had executed or imprisoned in gulags an entire generation of scientists, mathematicians, and engineers. That generation had been well-educated in the humanities and had been insistent upon the human factor being preeminent in every di dimension of technological projects. And it was their devotion to the human factor that precipitated their imprisonment or their execution. Meanwhile, Stalin hastily raised up yes-men who could build the monstrosities that epitomized his vision. In Stalin's mind, engineering was a propaganda tool of the state. So the bigger, more impressive the project, the better, regardless of how harebrained the scheme was. For example, consider <clears throat> um, the White Sea Canal, which stretched from the White Sea to the Baltic. Oh, I, uh, Chernobyl uh, was at the end of this era. So let's just stick White Sea Canal. The workers uh, in this uh, situation worked with nothing uh, but hand tools. They were given 20 months to fulfill a project while living in tents with temperatures of 10 degrees Fahrenheit, that is. Food was scarce, toilet froze, obviously. On top of exhaustion and exposure, workers suffered epidemics of tuberculosis, typhus, and smallpox. They died at the rate of 10,000 every month and by the time the 20-month project was finished, over 200,000 workers had died. Sadly, the canal didn't function as planned either <laughs> once it was finished. The wood frame and the gates quickly rotted, and for five months out of the year, the canal turned out to be too shallow for ocean-going vessels. Uh, one of the famous mathematicians who had been locked into the gulag was Alexander Solzhenitsyn. I'm sure you've heard his name. In 1966, many years after his own prison term, he returned to spend a summer day watching the canal. Uh, and in eight hours, he saw only two flat-bottomed barges traveling the canal, each loaded with timber and heading in the opposite direction. 
Lauren Graham, who did the historical work in this period, chronicling the demise of Soviet engineering during the, the Stalinist era, uh, wrote the book, The Ghost of the Executed Engineer. He summarized it this way. In the decades beginning with the 30s, the Soviet Union produced more engineers than any other country in the world because the previous generation obviously was locked up or dead. But these new engineers, so-called, were the ones who had learned the lesson that they must not meddle in politics or social issues. The breed of new engineers uh, were not engineers at all, but merely technicians who did what they're told, and Soviet engineering slid into what has been called the gray profession. In what follows tonight, I address myself not to technicians, um, but to engineers, to those who have been in educated in the humanities and thus carry a heightened concern for social issues. For it's this sort of person, the engineer, who's capable of comprehending what I mean by the concept design. And in fact, design reasoning itself is a crucial ingredient in the in apprenticeship of engineers at Catholic universities. In 2003, <coughs> excuse me, I had the good fortune to be invited uh, to participate in a humanities fellowship faculty seminar in which colleagues from both uh, College of Arts and Sciences and the School of Engineering at my university studied the role of engineering at Catholic universities. Uh, the seminar culminated in a 2005 conference, uh, much like the one uh, here at St. Thomas. But importantly for me, I had culminated in a friendship with a mechanical engineer named Drew Murray. Not a very flattering picture. Although my dad was a mechanical engineer, and although I was hired to teach engineering ethics, I, I really had little idea how engineering design worked. And the more Drew and I talked, the more we realized an important overlap between our two fields. So in my field, it goes like this. There is no single right answer in ethics. There may be entirely wrong answers but within the range of roughly acceptable responses, each proposed answer or, uh, must be evaluated for its relative context-bound satisfactoriness. And then Drew says this, oh, there's no single correct design. There may be entirely wrong designs, but within the range of roughly acceptable responses to a design problem, each proposed response must be evaluated for its relative context-bound satisfactoriness. So we co-authored a proposal and were funded to teach an ethics by design course. The upshot of the course was that we found we could teach ethics uh, by close attention to the process of team design in a competitive environment where the team's winnings affected each student's grade at the end of the term. For the remainder of my time, I want to argue uh, what we taught in this course, that what engineers describe as design, what they call design reasoning, is analogous to what philosophers have forever described as practical reasoning. After outlining uh, the ancient Greek position as kind of a conceptual baseline, I will focus on four specific similarities between practical reasoning or ethical reasoning and design reasoning. As practical reasoning is the basis for making decisions in ethics, the strength of the similarities implies that design itself can be a fruitful way to teach ethics to engineers. The analogy, however, is imperfect. So uh, the paper ends with a look at the dissimilarity, especially the tendency in practical reasoning to be rooted in history, while the reigning paradigm in design places the greatest value on innovation that is radically new, radically distinct from the past. So the open question remains, how might the past reliably guide the future of morally sound engineering design? But first things first, both ethical reasoning and design reasoning are modes of what the ancients classified practical reasoning. My first task will be to describe four similarities. They start out pretty easy. First, practical reasoning terminates in action. How trivial can it be? While this mark sounds trivial, it's the mark that distinguishes practical reasoning from theoretical reasoning. The first mark is that practical reasoning terminates in concrete action. On the one hand, it's expressed by the self-evident piece of advice that you would give to your co-op student or to your new hire. At the appropriate time, freeze the design process and go into production. That'd be true. 
Clearly, one can rush too quickly into production, wind up with an inferior product. But one can also tinker with a project far too long and miss the moment or be scooped by a competitor. However, having said this, I've really said nothing about when the appropriate time is. But it's clear that good design must result in physical action at some point. Now, if Aristotle were present, he would urge me to maybe illustrate the point this way. This carpet up here supposedly needs cleaning. And aha, here's a Hoover vacuum cleaner right under here. I'm not yet finished with my practical reasoning process until I actually plug in the Hoover vacuum cleaner and run it across the rug a few times. If I stop short of actually vacuuming the rug, practical reasoning has been aborted, and I cannot say that I've done it at all. Now, on the one hand, then, action stands in contrast to non-action. But in a deeper sense, I want you to see that action also is meant to stand in contrast to the concept of an answer or a conclusion. If I tally a column of numerals, I draw a line and write in the answer. Aristotle would call that activity theoretical reasoning. Theoretical reasoning terminates in a conclusion. Practical reasoning terminates in an action. Second, satisfactoriness is the criteria for assessing practical reasoning. Design reasoning is a species of practical reasoning that occurs in the ambiguous space between the skill of only one right response and the charybdis of anything goes. Strangely, theoretical reasoning can do very little to diminish the ambiguity of this space. Let me illustrate this with an example from another practical discipline, namely music. Ancient Greeks observed uh, the mathematical relationship between musical notes, I'm sure you know this, Pythagorean and all that, for example, if the A string under the guitar is pinned down at its bisection, the string will still play an A, albeit an octave higher. Pure doubling of the string's oscillations. Instead of an A440, say it'll be an A880. So perhaps music composition is driven by mathematics. Well, let's number the piano scale by half steps with numerals 1 to 12, shall we? And now let's take the familiar uh, some familiar chime to the Westminster clock and see if I can get this to work. Ah, there it is. Hang on. Oh. You know this tune. We have no sound. Ah, how sad. Okay. We don't know. It was working earlier. Any way to fix that? up. <laughs> Speakers at 80 percent. Should be able to hear. Yeah, there we go. All that work for just those notes, right? <laughs> now, if you represent as numerals, uh, the tune can be rendered by our keys: eleven, seven, nine, two, two, nine, eleven, seven. Right? The eight-note sequence in this case makes use of only four keys: the two, the seven, the nine, the eleven. So the question has hit some composers. Can music be composed, which is to say designed, mathematically? One approach begins by observing that our eight-note sequence, in this case, only involves two of the possible combinations of the four keys. The music of Pierre Boulez composes music by cranking out every mathematical permutation of, say, those four keys, because his music is constrained by logical necessity of mathematical permutations, Boulay's music exemplifies, on the one hand, the only one right answer approach. His music sounds like this. 
You get the idea. By stark contrast, John Cage takes the anything goes kind of approach. Cage, as it were, seeks to set music free from the strictures of mathematics. It's as if he composes by simply rolling a 12-sided die and plays whatever note comes up next. <laughs> Enough of that. Now, so I hope you understand what I'm saying is that in the process that we're facing in design, we have these two extremes. Uh, there are those who think that, look, mathematics, logic, science will drive design and will give us a necessary solution, one right answer. We'll be able to look that up in the back of the book, right? And on the other hand, I say, no, nah, no, nah, you, can't, you can't do that. Oh, so then anything goes, right? So we have these two extremes. Music is driven by mathematical necessity, the one, uh, only one right answer. Sounds pretty awful. Cage's music follows anything goes and is also pretty painful to hear. But between the extremes of the only one, the mathematical necessity and anything goes, it's the realm of design reasoning, practical reasoning. So this question still remains, however, what is the criteria of good design if it's not math logic? Wasn't Bach, whose cello suite we were listening to, uh, was it not, uh, was not Bach himself sensitive to mathematics? Of course. Mathematics and its cousin logic are not absent from design, that's not what I'm saying. It's rather that they're not the criteria, not logic, but satisfactoriness, which is a very odd word. Uh, and incidentally, satisfactoriness ought not be confused with satisficing. Some of you are, have heard that term before. Satisficing just means to do the bare minimum. That's not what I'm after, so let me explain what I am after. On the practical reasoning view, logic and math, science, constitute the field on which maybe design occurs, or maybe the boundary condition. You can't violate V equals IR or F equals MA and get away with it. But by saying logic and math are the field or boundary conditions for design is entirely different from saying that they compel or necessitate any particular outcome. They don't drive design. Within the range of logically permissible, scientifically and mathematically permissible responses, each proposed response has to be evaluated for whether or not it's satisfactory. Suppose I'm out hiking, right? I realize a nasty storm is brewing I'm motivated to find shelter. If I happen upon a sandstone cave, like this one here, I can find satisfactory shelter there. Practical reasoning problem solved. Easy peasy lemon squeezy, as my granddaughter says. But of course, logic didn't compel my choice. True enough, logic prevented me from taking shelter in Australia but it didn't compel my choice of this particular cave. Why not? Well, I might as well just as easily opened up my umbrella or sprinted for the Motel 6 that I can see just up the road. Details of my surrounding context matter enormously for finding a satisfactory response. That's design. We have to pay attention to context. Now, Students uh, that I teach are sometimes bothered by the fact that there may be more than one satisfactory response to a given design problem. Obviously, there are many responses that are clearly wrong, but we have to be honest with ourselves. There are also an indefinite number of satisfactory responses. The cave happens to be one of them. The third mark follows quickly upon the third, and it's this. In practical reasoning, details matter. Details of the context change everything. If I dart into that cave in order to beat the downpour, it would matter enormously if there was a bear in the cave, right? And here we can see the categorical difference between matters of logic and matters of practical reasoning. Consider the classic logical syllogism. All mortals are human. Socrates was human, 
therefore Socrates was mortal. Yes, you say, but Socrates was Greek, huh? <laughs> Doesn't matter. Well, he was he was balding. So so what? Well, okay, so he's he was Greek, balding, and he had a pug nose. Nothing changes, not in classical logical syllogisms. Details don't matter in that sense. Nothing will interrupt the conclusion that Socrates himself was mortal. Details are simply irrelevant in matters of math and logic. Thus, what marks the mathematician is that he or she can take the problem elsewhere, solve it in their, on their sofa or in their office. But not for design reasoning, you can't take it elsewhere and solve it. Not for practical reasoning and not for ethics. The details of the context matter. In the first half uh, of the 19th century, uh, U.S. manufacturing had successfully scaled up the size of cannons used on naval gunships. By 1844, the largest gun, uh, gun was aboard the USS Princeton and was dubbed the Peacemaker. Its inaugural firing was the occasion of a large celebration and attended by a large number of dignities, including some of then President Tyler's own cabinet. Tragically, the cannon itself exploded and shrapnel uh, from the barrel killed five, including two of the cabinet ministers. What had gone wrong was not the math, but an overlooked detail. Cannon barrels had been scaled up steadily in size over the past couple decades, but the time required to work the wrought iron barrel had also increased. Unknown at the time, writes Lee historian, a uh, historian Lee per Pearson, was that if wrought iron is heated to near the melting point for a long enough time, its grains, polycrystallites, Increase in size and impurities tend to collect at those grain boundaries, which thus become a serious plane of weakness. Because that small detail is overlooked, namely the amount of time required to work the largest cannon ever, the barrel had lost half its strength. Well, now we're in thick weeds, aren't we? Because at the moment, we can admit that there may be a host of relevant details that we need to keep track of. And in addition, there are many things that conspire against your and my ability to detect the relevant details. In the case of the Peacemaker Canon, designers were blocked by an ignorance that shadowed the entire industry or the entire practice. No one at the time knew. Now, given the contingent and entropy-laden feature of our natural world, we have to admit there may always be details that are going to be opaque to us. Fortunately for us, chaotic systems are frequently enough near e equilibrium and engineers have had some experience trying to cope with entropy over the centuries. But the fact remains that because engineering occurs at the interface of physical and social worlds, there will always be unforeseeable contingencies. The technical term for this situation is called a wicked problem. It's great, if you ask me, I can give you the, the footnote to an excellent journal article on the marks of wicked problems, but let me press on. Fourth, an eye for relevant detail requires bodily training. As you and I know, not every detail in the surrounding context is significant. If I dash into that cave to escape the weather, only to find that it's all in already inhabited by a duck? My plan is still pretty good. The presence of a duck is not a relevant detail, unless it's the Aflac duck, I guess. But, but not every detail is as readily distinguishable from the trivial as a bear would be distinguished from a duck. So how, in, how are we supposed to distinguish just which details are the relevant ones, the ones worth noticing? Well, at this stage, uh, I need to shift uh, uh, gears and give you an, another uh, discipline to help you see this. Um, details that share relevance um, get packaged together in the act of perception, not in the act of cogitation. We might call the set of relevant details uh, a gestalt. Um, for that matter, I'm betting that uh, I can guess what every one of you drew on the cover of your third grade notebook. Right, right. 
the Necker Cube. In fact, uh, it's called the Gestalt. It's the classic Gestalt because um, Gestalt just is the German word for form. Uh, this is actually a two-dimensional object, right? It's only two dimensions, but we see it as a three-dimensional object. Where does that third dimension come from? It's how we perceive it. It's added b effortlessly by us as we've experienced our life inside of boxes, sitting on top of boxes, speaking behind boxes, etc. Now, <clears throat> not so effortless is what the novice has to do when he or she is trying to learn how to gather together the relevant details. Consider architecture. The novice architect must work very hard to interpret a blueprint. The more skilled he or she becomes, the less they interpret and the more they read it, even at a glance, even upside down. We're not talking about a skill-based perception, not about a, a mentally driven interpretation. Uh, every uh, discipline has a perceptional di dimension to it. For example, here's what a gallbladder looks like in a high school biology textbook, nicely colored schematic. As you can see where the gallbladder is, bright green, right there in the middle. Now, when you graduate from high school and go on to college and then on to med school, uh, the higher skill step would be this, where now you're looking at a photograph that's labeled, and you can imagine their uh, tests are photographs without labels, and you have to figure it out and label it correctly. But no amount of labeling can teach you to discern the distant analogy of this photograph um, with what the surgeon actually saw when he opened up the woman who reported to have gallbladder problems. That's what he saw. An apprenticeship is a timeful process that requires training one's bodily senses. The surgeon that has gotten to this point to identify that enormous thing is the gallbladder and it had better come out has spent hours and hours and hours training to look and see in other people at the hands of or uh, under the watchful eye of somebody who knows what they're doing until they reach the process, uh, the point of, per, uh, of expertise themselves. It's an illuminating exercise to trace the historical pendulum swings uh, in engineering education between the emphasis on the one hand on theoretical reasoning and courses in logic and math and science and the emphasis on that hands-on training that constitute and build into practical reasoning. Um, historian Keith Gispin notes that at the 1876 World's Fair in Philadelphia, oh, oh yeah, I was gonna tell you about this. Let me, uh, let me back up. There is, uh, as an example of, of tacit, uh, or sorry, of skilled perception, one of my students went on a co-op uh, as a chemical engineer for a company uh, called Silfex, and she got this page and a half list of essential duties and responsibilities and then qualifications. And on the back side, uh, it says stuff like this. You have to be able to deal with nonverbal symbolism. Sure, formula, scientific equation, no problem, graphs, got it, musical notes. What? Musical notes? What are you talking about? That's what they want in students. While performing the duties of this job, the employee is regularly required to talk or hear, taste or smell. The employee is frequently required to stand, walk, sit, use hands to finger, handle, feel. The employee is occasionally required to reach with hands and arms, climb or balance, stoop, kneel, crouch or crawl. It's a full body experience. <laughs> 1876, World's Fair in Philadelphia. Uh, engineers from all over came to display their wares. You have the French and the British and the Germans and they all came to America and they gawked at what we did and we gawked at what they did and the Germans hung their head in shame and wrote back to their fellows, German engineering is billig und schlecht. German engineering is cheap and bad. And as of 1876, the German Society for Engineering, the VDI, overhauled its educational system so that they could start to match what the Brits and the Americans uh, were doing. So Keith Gibson uh, writes 
In Berlin, laboratory and drafting hours went from roughly 35% of the total time devoted to instruction in 1881 and 2 to 45% in 1886 and 7, 48% in 89, and oh, this should be 95 and 96, sorry. But look at this, over 70% of your school hours are spent in hands-on things like drawing, like drafting, like working uh, in the lab, or today we'd send them on co-ops, that, that sort of thing. Of course, former generations of American engineers had always had this hands-on skill, sometimes uh, no college degree at all. Uh, my dad, that was one of his patents. Uh, April 22nd, eight days after I was born. He got the filing on that particular patent. My dad has nu numerous patents to his uh, name, but he had no college degree. What my dad possessed, as well as a century of American engineers before him, was this tacit skill, knowledge that came from experience and, and resided in the fingertips. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not against science physics major myself to teach high school physics, so I, I like science. Um, but my dad, nor his compatriots, would have been surprised that after the Germans injected more hands-on training, learning in their college courses, that the rest of the world would come to recognize German engineering as precision. <laughs> Billy von Cohen from UT uh, observes that um, the truth observes that the truth that excellence in engineering depends on bodily training is, is displayed by the languages that we speak. In English, we say students ought to be able to eyeball it in order to double check their calculators. The French, he says, speak of engineering by the nose, le pi. The Germans describe it as by the fist, and Russians say it's measuring by the fingers. Here's his point and mine detection of relevant details, whether we're talking about design or ethics, that gestalt is a bodily skill, and we are, after all, embodied critters. It is an act of perception. Those of you who've worked in industry will vouch for that job description from Silfex. The need to perceive the relevant details is something that ethics also shares with the design reasoning process. And for this reason, we can use design exercises to train for both. So I want to just give you a couple examples. I ease my students into design reasoning by asking them to analyze where a device is good or bad, whether they give it a moral thumbs up or thumbs down, and, and then we talk about why. Here's the Billy Cam. The Billy Cam is an app that calibrates a smartphone's camera with standardized photographic color register while it takes a picture of a newborn baby's skin. You can see the thing on the, on the chest there. By using the calibration swatch in the photo, the app is able to calculate the level of jaundice in the skin. Jaundice is a serious symptom of liver problems, and if it can detect the yellowing of the skin, then we can um, treat the infant. My students instantly generated many solid reasons for supporting the claim that this is a good device. For example, they say the use of smartphones is ubiquitous. We are living in an age where the world's poor are more likely to have a cell phone than they are a toilet. So the, that's true, by the way. So the, at least for 2.5 billion people. So the Billy Cam first is widely accessible. That makes it a good device. Second, it's very user friendly. Third, the device is portable, so midwives working in remote locations can determine whether or not a newborn uh, needs medical help. And to be honest, number four, the device's accuracy rivals that of a blood test. So far, so good. But then, of course, I have to play devil's advocate, insisting that students take time now and come up with 10 or more questions that they would like to ask that's not in the advertising copy that you read on the screen. What questions would you ask, and if you got the wrong answer, might change your impression of how good this device was? After some meandering discussion, one student asked kind of shyly, does this work on all skin tones? No. That's a relevant detail, right? As of July 1st this year, 2016, 
white babies in the U.S. are a min and a minority, although I'm teaching a, a, a class of 100% whites in this particular section. Yeah, 50.2% of newborn Americans are shades other than white. So here is an ingenious device ostensibly intended to serve impoverished communities, and the device itself may apparently not work on over half the American population, and of course, even lower percentage of the world population. So that number now, 50.2%, figures prominently in, as a part of the gestalt. It's a highly relevant detail, and the students then can ratchet that forward. It's a context uh, laden question that they know to ask uh, the next time we run into something like this, like the next thing. This is, uh, let's see if, I, let's see if I'm lucky enough to get this to work. See if we get sound. Hello. My name is Thomas and this is Naveed. We are Inventors. All right. So that, that is uh, the gist of the sign aloud. Uh, it's an American Sign Language transliterator. Uh, once again, we must grant that this device, like the Billy Can, uh, is I incredibly clever. With respect to the intended purpose, it works, it functions well, so it does what it's supposed to. There are 70 million speakers of American Sign, and the gloves that he is wearing on the left. Uh, utilize Bluetooth connectivity to communicate with portable devices seems like an absolute winner. In fact, they did. They were uh, they won the Lemulison Prize for invention this past year. But my students had been primed by our Billy Cam discussion, and we also had in my class uh, a student who is hearing imp hearing impaired herself. So they were quick to ask that question: uh, Who gets left out? Who are the losers in this battle? Billy Von Cohen insists, and I happen to agree with him, that there are always losers. Every design comes at a cost, even if they're invisible. So by looking and searching for the missing but relevant detail, the students will gain a sharper eye. So we listen further to uh, the inventor's description of the work. If we played the whole clip, you'd get to this sentence. Currently, they say there is no commercial sign language translator on the market. With this invention, over 70 million people achieve a new level of independence. 70 million people gain access to a new job, and 70 million people secure a new quality of life, all with the help of a pair of gloves. The inventors go on to claim that their device aimed at the high ideal of complete inclusivity because no one should be left out of conversations, not even, and especially not, the 70 million deaf mutes globally. Now, there are a number of relevant details lurking here in the shadows I want to pull out. If you go to the World Federation of the Deaf website, they will say that it's unacceptable to use the term deaf-mute. It's not appropriate anymore, which the inventors didn't um, know about. So, in the first place, the very rhetoric employed in these engineers' de uh, defense of their um, device is offensive, and maybe we can let that slide. Their students, after all, give them a little elbow room for social insensitivity. So, on to number two. Their claim is also factually incorrect. An enormous percentage of the hearing impaired can speak. They're not deaf mutes, they're not mute. They are deaf who have learned to speak. It's taken them a lot of training and a great deal of work, but in fact, most do learn how to speak. They are not mute. In addition to stereotyping all deaf as mute, uh, third, these inventors have made the mistake of assuming that all deaf persons worldwide speak American Sign Language. It's not so. That isn't even true in America because there are many dialects of sign language even in America. It has not been standardized. To make things more difficult, every country has its own versions of signs, so their device cannot yet help 70 million globally deaf. Fourth, the inventor's promotional clip slides over the fact that in order for the device to work, the motion of the signer must be the same every time, it has to be uniform. If you rewatch the demonstration, uh, you will notice how clean and deliberate the hand and arm motions are. But people don't sign this way any more than they speak precise English aloud. 
In point of fact, I was at a convention once uh, and witnessed uh, signers taking, terms, uh, taking turns doing translation in the front row, and what they were doing was, was beautiful. It was artful. You could call it hand ballet with lots of uh, wonderful uh, swooping uh, gestures. And nobody had of the deaf there had any problem understanding what they were saying, even though they were not speaking like robots. But now onto a couple more difficult ones. The device, clever as it is, puts the burden on the hearing impaired to fix their own problem. And they do that for why? For our sake, for the sake of us who can hear just fine. There's something inverted about those priorities. It'd be like making paraplegics tote their own ramp so they can get up and down our sidewalk curbs. But sixth, and perhaps most seriously of all, if you think about it, the device does its work in a manner such that no deaf person has any means for double checking the accuracy of what is being spoken verbally. Imagine the risk involved for to the glove wearer when they're negotiating a legal or a financial contract. In the end, the device, granted, it's very clever and they should win a prize. I, I'm not objecting to that. It appears to be as much for the convenience of the normal hearer as for the small percentage of hearing impaired who cannot speak. And I want en our engineers to be able to see those other kinds of relevant details. So my p point, lest you mistake my meaning in the illustrations, is not to slam the ingenuity or value of these two inventions. It's rather to highlight the pedagogical usefulness of using design, or in, or in this case, reverse design, to help my students begin to see which details are, are maybe most relevant, both technologically relevant and ethically relevant. And I grant that talking about design is a far cry from actually doing it, but it is a start. And I'm easing students into a, a way of seeing. Ethics is not an ingredient in design, but that which permeates every phase an aspect of a design. Uh, some of you are familiar maybe with the work of designer Stuart Pugh. On this slide, you can see an expansion of his concept of the design boundary or the design periphery. Uh, uh, the version here says that there are uh, a, a number 37 little starbursts that, that talk about areas that may be relevant or maybe not to a particular design that's happening in the core, in the center. Um, but all are legitimate candidates for discussion until they're uh, eliminated. Once the students uh, are engaged in conversation, they can start to see that there maybe are important <coughs> questions they should be asking. So there is an ethics periphery that is uh, identical to it. So we might ask materials. Okay, I'm building a device that uses copper uh, for industrial kitchen use. Where does the copper come from? 40% of the copper in America is uh, imported. 14% of that comes from Peru. You should read about the mines in Peru. Does using, per if we don't know where the copper comes from in our device that we're designing, doesn't that mean that our, de our device may be at danger of being tainted morally? Aesthetics, eh, we do that last, right? Well, maybe if we build an ugly bridge Imagine an ugly bridge. Seems to me a bridge fell down in Minneapolis a while back. Um, if we rebuild this bridge and it's ugly, every person who looks at that bridge gets a little ding on their soul. And after 10 or 20 or 30 years go by and millions of dings are on souls across the land for seeing our ugly bridge, that, that's not as good as if it were a beautiful bridge. Shipping. Is it produced locally or shipped from afar for obvious emissions reasons? Wait, are people injured in the removal of the artifact from the shipping container? One of the senior design projects uh, at, at the University of Dayton had to do with redesigning a shipping carton in which parts for transmissions for trucks came in um, to uh, one of the automotive manufacturers. They came in very reinforced cardboard crates that were four feet by four feet by four feet. But they had people working in uh, the shipping facility that uh, were women who were less than five and a half, half feet tall. So to pick up a 40 pound piece of metal at the bottom of the shipping crate, they had to lean on their gut over the edge of the crate and 
bruise their spleen in the process. Can we maybe figure out a better way to design that? I mean, that seems like it could be an ethical question. Infrastructure. Does infrastructure disadvantage poor or minorities? How in the world is that possible? Well, you should read the tale of Robert Moses. Some of you maybe are familiar. The New York, Pi uh, the New York um, Parkway system in New York City. Uh, there are 200 overpasses that allow um, traffic to go over, but only vehicles less than eight and a half feet tall to go under. In the time that he designed it in the 1940s, um, the ethical, the, uh, sorry, ethnic minorities uh, uniformly took buses that were nine and a half feet tall. And that meant that all ethnic minorities, and especially the poor ethnic minorities, Latinos, Puerto Ricans, and the blacks in New York City, would be prohibited from taking those parkways to the public beaches in the summer when there's no air conditioning anywhere because it hadn't been brought to New York State yet. He did that on purpose. He wanted to exclude the riffraff from the beaches. So it's infrastructure, and it disadvantaged the poor. Once our students are asking these kind of questions, they're ready to face a series of design, design, team, team, design team challenges, and uh, perhaps um, each challenge sur surpassing the previous challenge in ethical density. Let me um, change uh, topics slightly then, because I've given you the four. My task thus far has been to describe for you four similarities that mark practical reasoning and to argue that because ethical reasoning and design reasoning are, are both forms of practical reasoning, they share enough of an overlap uh, to enable the use of design for teaching ethics and the use of ethics for teaching design. So let me turn finally to, uh, briefly, an examination of one crucial difference between engineering design and ethical reasoning. As you probably know, the emphasis today uh, in engineering design is innovation. By and large, this is a very good emphasis. After all, design results when you can't Google the solution. If you can't Google it, it stands to reason you're gonna have to innovate. You're gonna have to make it up. Thus, in teaching design, we give students problems in which they must innovate, where they must respond to problems whose solution isn't in the back of the book. But somewhere along the line, we've made the innovation the primary goal and confused something that is just new with something that is actually better. Historian uh, John Sotomayor suggests um, that the confusion lies back in the mythology of automated technological progress. There's an interesting article called The Perils of Progress Talk that he wrote. Sotomayor used this statue by uh, Louise Lentz Woodruff at uh, the Chicago Expo, A Century of Progress in 1933. The statue is emblematic of human passivity before technology. What, uh, uh, oh sorry, the statue is emblematic of human passivity before the robot technology that gently leads these children into their future. Stoudemire thinks that our passivity is a function of our current cultural milieu in the United States. As a people, we Americans uh, are simultaneously drawn in two directions at once. You'll probably understand this. On the one hand, we're pulled in the direction of what he calls the American sublime, to a virgin land, a life of peace, serenity, and community, and fly fishing. No, he doesn't say that. On the other hand, we are pulled in the direction that is Faustian and rapacious, the desire for power, wealth, and productivity, the urge to dominate nature and remake the world. Problem is, we can't have it both ways. In response, Stoudemire goes on to argue, is that we opt for what is called the sweet promise of technological progress. In other words, we put all our eggs into the technological basket in the futile hope that one day technology will give us both serenity and power, both community and domination. Meanwhile, we're just gonna simply let technology do its thing, blithely assuming technology is getting better and better, that it is progressing on its own. And he calls this the myth of autonomous progressive determinism. You may have seen the recent article in the New Atlantis um, shed some additional light on this situation. Uh, the author, who is a professor of science and society at Arizona State, um, Daniel Sarowitz, documents the current and alarming 
evidence of research misconduct in the scientific sphere. I don't know how many of uh, you have been tracking how many uh, retractions there have been in pr uh, top flight journals. Unprecedented and embarrassing level of faulty science. He diagnoses the problem this way. He says that there is a well-recognized pervasive bias that infects every corner of the basic research enterprise, a bias that we and all of we in the sciences share, and he calls it a bias towards the new result. Sarowitz traces uh, the beginning of this uh, research paradigm uh, back to what he calls the bald-faced but beautiful lie that scientific progress on a broad front results from the free play of free intellects working on subjects of their own choice in a manner dictated by their curiosity for exploration of the unknown. And he says, that, that's a lie. He says, it's a fable. The fable was first and most elegantly propagated by MIT's Vannevar Bush in 1945. Some 70 years and many research dollars later, Sarowitz argues, we are now reaping the result. As an enterprise, science isn't self-correcting, it's self-destructing. The solution that Sarowitz offers is this. He says, quote, to save the enterprise, scientists must come out of the lab and into the real world, end quote. Scientific progress is not the result of free play. It is the result of hard work aimed at some specific predetermined hope for good. In the short run, because engineers have real world dirt under their fingernails, it's the engineers who must set the agenda for scientists and not the other way around. Sarowitz himself takes it one step further, noting that the time when scientific advance was most rapid was during and after World War II. He concludes that beyond engineers, both engineers and scientists need some sort of autocratic authority to dictate the agenda, something on the order of the Department of Defense. Practical reasoning always proceeds from some preconception of the good. Aristotle called it the telos, the aim, the end, the purpose, the goal at which reasoning aims. Additionally, it is the telos that gives us the bridge that we need to properly use ethical terms. The telos of my wristwatch is that it's to tell time. So if that's the telos, if that's what it's for, timekeeping, then my claim that this is a good watch, you know immediately that I mean to say it fulfills its tell us. It keeps time accurately. Or if I say, how ought a wristwatch behave? The answer is, well, it ought to be accurate. So we move quickly to the words good and ought simply from knowing what the thing is for. The answer is a reflection of the tell us. As an ethicist, I think Sarowitz is correct to say that the goods, goods are not automatic, but I think he's wrong to say that goods are best dictated by the military. So we come to the point does the engineering enterprise as a whole have a telos? If we think that the telos is intellectual free play, then we'll have no guarantee that we'll get anything but endless free play. Of course, this is circular. It amounts to defining good in terms of newness and then justifying the pursuit of good newness just because that's what is good. On the screen, you can see advertising images uh, for the Numi, Kohler's high-end toilet features a lid that automatically opens and closes, blows warm air on your feet, cleans and dries your behind with a bidet and retractable air wand, all the while playing your favorite music. The fact that it's controlled by a computer means that the owners of the toilet run the risk that their toilet may crash and need to be rebooted. What would you call that, the blue bowl of death? I guess I can. Is this good engineering? Is this what engineering is for? It costs $6,000. Novelty by itself, I argue, is not a substantive definition of the good. Novelty is not a big enough tell us to satisfy our students' questions, what is engineering for? If pure engineering uh, was a good, sorry, if pure innovation is good in and of itself, then Kohler engineers are left with no leverage for objecting to the way their talents are being used, while 2.5 billion people in the world don't have toilets at all. My deepest concern is that the notion of good that provides a north star by which engineering and science can navigate is not something new, but something old. 
The telos cannot be innovation itself, but part of a centuries-old conversation about what human life is for. We are none of us born, um, oh, sorry, back up one paragraph. Since at least the 1960s, a philosophy called existentialism taught that to be human required great courage, for we are left with nothing but to blindly rush into the future, navigating by the seat of our pants, responding to each obstacle armed only by our wits, precisely because there is no road map. Why is there no road map? The existentialists tell us because there is no destination. We just have to make it up as we go like Indiana Jones. While well, existentialism has fallen on hard times, a superior metaphor has been heard in some quarters. We don't rush forward into the future, we back into the future while facing the past. We are none of us born with the human telos genetically imprinted on our DNA. Left to our own devices, human beings are free, really, to screw up our lives and the world, as we have daily proof. The telos, if it is all, if it is available to us at all, it must be embodied in our joint past. We learn visions of the telos from those who've traveled before us. They are competing, they, there are, of course, competing accounts of the telos, but they all come from our past, and we must learn to listen. So conclusions, just three. We can teach ethics as we teach, and by means of teaching, which is design. Innovation is not the aim of engineering, much less its greatest good. Engineers back into the future while conversing with the past. Thank you very much. I, I know that everybody wants to get the wine and cheese thing going, uh, but I think we have a couple minutes for question and answer. Apparently there are uh, microphones if you want to ask a question. And time's up. <laughs> okay, here it comes. Thank you. He knew that an engineer, um, not a theologian. Um, it strikes me the idea of innovation not being the aim of engineering and not its greatest good. It reminds me of Laud Alto C and yes. Pope Francis and his objections to the technocratic pr paradigm, yeah. and that also saying what we do with our technology is ought to be oriented towards some sort of common good or integral development. Right. I'm wondering if in your teaching that's found much um, foothold with your students as they think about their sources for what the greatest good might be. Uh, yeah, it seems like there's at least two steps to, to that argument. Uh, one, we have a cultural bias that um, devices are only neutral until they're used for some nefarious purpose. They could be good or bad. Uh, with this hammer, I can build a house, or with this hammer, I can cave in your skull. N the, the problem is helping students see that, yeah, but why did they build a hammer in the first place? It was to drive nails, and so the telos is built in. Um, but I'm, I'm fully on board with the second move that you're making that, as uh, Pope Francis says, everything is connected. And that's part of what um, my friend uh, Drew Murray and I uh, tried to try to think about in, in the way we do design challenges where uh, we have these teams of students that face, at first they do the simple tiny game, but by the end they're built, you know, they're con concept designing uh, monuments uh, that have to take note of Dayton history uh, and context and where and location and all that stuff to help them think about um, what's shared. Uh, our city is uh, divided by a river um, between the white and the black, between the rich and the poor, it's one of the most racially divided towns in the Midwest. Uh, so to think about wh what side of the river are you going to put this monument on, you better, <laughs> you better think about this, right? Because it, uh, and that just goes to what you're suggesting, it, that every, everything connected. Yeah. I'll see if I can articulate what I'm thinking here. It has to do with the relationship of your uh, view of it, engineering ethics or ethics of technology or whatever you want to, whatever the broad term is, 
and, and ABET, the Accreditation Board for Engineering Technology, they've been pushing for social uh, and cultural and aesthetic uh, ingredients in engineering education for, for years now. Yeah, right, um, right. You, your point here is that ethical considerations cannot be added on, but must be woven in to the process, yet would ABET, I mean, if you're offering a course on this topic, isn't that a contradiction? Because ABIT would say, oh, lovely, you have a course on ethics, but yet you're adding it on rather than weeding it in. I wonder if you can describe your process in satisfying ABIT. Uh, yeah, well, don't I know it. Um, well, so the, it, it actually, the ABIT, um, at the moment, uh, uh, mm, I want to refrain from answering with too much detail because I actually just supply my syllabus and somebody else handles that to see if I it, it passes uh, the ABET um, thing. Seems to me that what ABET brings to us is a is a more like a the first floor, the basement, the the, the layer beneath which we don't want to sink. There's so much more room on on top of that. Now, the second point that you bring up that th isn't a contradiction in terms that I'm, that I'm using a course to teach practical reasoning. I mean, I, I do have to tell this to my students. I say, look, um, is this believable? I had an A-plus student, one of the most brilliant ones I'd ever had, and he was a jerk that everybody in the class hated. What's wrong with this picture? And they say, oh, yeah, it's totally believable. Why? Why is it possible that you can get an A-plus in an ethics course and be a total jerk that everybody dislikes? Well, that's because a course is only measuring theoretical reasoning. How else can it be anything but? Unless we add service learning uh, in, in great measure, which um, takes an enormous amount of energy to do service learning. And in certain institutions, there is not time for a faculty member with other pressures to even attempt that. Um, maybe somebody, uh, somebody here has had lots of uh, luck with service, um, but we, um, yeah, um, okay. Did I get to even your question a little bit? Okay. Hey, my friend from Baylor. A question I have for you is you mentioned uh, engineering design and ethics having some similarities in that they can give multiple approximately correct answers, but there are also some completely wrong answers. Yes. Could you add to the, those two things, uh, theology as well, that we get approximately good answers, but there are also bad answers? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, although um, my fundamentalist friends would disagree um, that uh, there's only one right answer. But I, I do think that um, the way I approach theological ethics is the way that I approach theology. That, I mean, if you read the book of Phili Philippians, in Greek, which I was trying to do, you'll see how many times Paul uses phronesis, which is that practical reasoning throughout that letter. It, it's amazing. To have the mind of Christ is to have the phronesis of Christ. Not the Sophia, not the theoretical wisdom of the Godhead, but to have the practical reasoning. I'm supposed to love my neighbor. Well, how am I going to do that? That's a design reasoning sort of exercise that I have to do uh, today. So, uh, yeah, I, I completely <laughs> agree. Uh, that may get me in trouble with some fundamentalist, but I totally agree. I have a question, Brad. Oh, so yeah. as I'm listening to your talk and what as an engineering educator, I'm trying to get our engineering students and some of them in the audience that, you know, you should feel comfortable extrapolating out into the future. And even though it is unknown, mm -hmm. and even though it is uh, perhaps an unsafe place in terms of calculations and, and, and understanding whether it's going to be the right solution. Yeah. And then listening tonight, we even had another sort of barrier of 30, you said the 37 perimeters uh, questions that should be asked, you know, and, and our engineering ethics core is saying, well, do no harm, do uh, what's best for the public welfare. And considering all these things, how do we balance these sort of fears of engineers extrapolating into the future or fear of an engineering violating one of these 37 tenets with the absolute need to keep moving forward in some way, and it's somewhat to the yeah. end of your talk that, that you were starting to address this, and I see there's a, there's a contradiction there, that there's, there's, there's this, this inhibiting forces of not dealing with the future, inhibiting forces of, not, uh, of, of do no harm, um, but we must move forward as engineers. Right. So how do we balance that? Well, yeah, that's, that's a really great question. Um, in the diagram, which I didn't have time to go into great detail, 
those actually weren't tenets, um, but more talking points, some of which are relevant on some design projects and others, um, others are not. I think um, one of the things that st students, uh, they, they love solving problems, the engineering students that we teach, and they love being analytical, and we can use that. So I, I, have, I put a case before them and I say, all right, so you've heard the coffee cup case where the lady Stella Liebeck spills coffee in her lap, third degree burns, gets a million dollars. And so I play this, this is one of five cases that I give, the, the only non-engineering case, except might be. Okay, so I say, look, um, each team come up with 10 questions. If you're on the jury, what, what are good questions? Because you don't have enough information yet to rule either in favor of McDonald's or this lady who got burned. So they come up with questions. I say, that's not good enough. I write them all on the board. We've got 30 questions. I say, go back, give me 10 more. And they, why? And they grouse about it, but when they, they go back, the next round of questions is really good. And so then we move on to some uh, other design um, problems, um, whether it's a lawsuit involving a, uh, a hammer hatchet that chipped off and hit somebody in the eye or designing a warehouse in Chicago. When I force them to go back and ask another 10 questions, and if it's an honors class, I say, yeah, go home, do it again. Here are the ones, here's the 25 we've come up with. You're still missing stuff. And they have to come back. They gain confidence in asking, asking questions. And that's really the way to move into the future is by asking questions. Are, is there any, what, what questions can I ask about shipping containers? Start asking them. And maybe it turns out there's, it, it's not a fruitful area of conversation. It, it's the students that, because they're afraid, and of course we want virtue of courage. You know, Thomas Aquinas, uh, in his list of the, of the virtues, he covers courage first in the list. He does that because we live in a contingent universe where we can't predict what's gonna happen tomorrow. We intend to do no harm, but we really have no idea. And whether or not we intend to, society will sue you. <laughs> I do give a seminar on uh, how to avoid being sued. Uh, they take good notes there, but uh, but the questioning, yeah. Um, you seem to identify or define innovation um, with what I learned 35 years ago was creativity mm. when it was juxtaposed with innovation. I realize the language has changed. Mm. Um, Toyota one of the most successful organizations, um, engineering, defines innovation as learning uh, applied to creating value. There is no word new yeah. in that definition. Al Ward actually captured that in their development center. Um, but even going with either definition of innovation as new, or um, learning applied to creating value. If that's not the end or the aim of engineering, what is? Thank you very much. Uh, I had not heard Toyota's definition and uh, I appreciate the, the clarification. Uh, I um, was talking about the newness um, thing Learning applied to creating value. Is that how it goes? Thank you. So, so you talked about early on, you have to at some point stop the design and make the thing. <laughs> yeah. He over here talked about we want to move into the future and that we're notoriously bad at predicting the future. So Henry Petrosky would argue that failures are what advances engineering yeah, and right. they're going to happen no matter what you do I don't care how well you model it, I don't care how well you predict the future, but you have to stop sometime and do it. And I don't think there's a lot of people who realize that and yeah, recognize yeah. that all things are gonna have failures and the key is that you learn from them and that you have criteria to learn from those yeah, failures. Right. And so I think that's also an important part of what you're having the students do because they have to think of all those possibilities. They're not gonna have thought of all of them but they might have criteria for thinking about the problem that arises. Yeah, right, very good, thank you very much. Sounds like a wrap.